Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on the 7th of February. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information, and you know there's a lot of different ways you can do that. We encourage you to visit our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. There's lots of different ways to go from that point to the information you're looking for, whether it's aviation weather, uh, you can find the aviation weather unit there, or uh, tsunami information about some of the recent earthquakes, or just how to stay safe when you're at your home along the coast. You can find that information there, as well as a new river ice thickness there. Uh, information from the Fairbanks Weather Forecast Office and the hydrology services around Alaska are always at your fingertips. And of course, your daily weather forecast and climate information. If you click on your part of Alaska, uh, you'll find links that'll take you to that type of information. You can also get your local forecast information at the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391. And if you can't find what you're looking for, please do email me anytime, david.snyder at noaa.gov, and I'm happy to serve you. Here's a look at what's going on across southeastern Alaska tonight. We've got two warnings or two alerts, let's say, for the Skagway area in the White Pass region. So just kind of all in the same little spot here. The high wind warning will see winds up to about 60 to 65 miles per hour, the worst of which will come through tonight. So from about 9 o'clock tonight until uh, 4 o'clock tomorrow morning, or tomorrow evening, I should say, 9 o'clock tonight, 4 o'clock in the evening tomorrow, a high wind warning is in effect for the Skagway area. You could see those gusts again uh, coming down the hill about 60 to 65 miles per hour. All that wind at the top of the hill around White Pass is also going to make it pretty cold, and a wind chill advisory has been posted to handle that. Uh, it could feel as cold as 40 below uh, if you're up there in the wind around White Pass. So if you're coming and going up and down the Klondike Highway or you have friends uh, traveling along that route, make sure they know that it is going to be pretty uh, bone chilling cold there and dangerous. A uh, frostbite can occur in about 30 minutes or less easily in temperatures like that. Uh, so make sure they're prepared for that just in case something happens along their drive. The high winds will uh, be blowing through the remainder of the afternoon and probably still going into Thursday night and Friday, but maybe not at that level of severity there. The winds also extend out into the Lynn Canal. We'll take a look at that with your marine forecast here, of course, in just a few minutes. Up north, a front is dropping a little bit further south out of the Beaufort Sea coast. And when this happened a couple days ago, we got into some blizzard conditions. So our friends at the Weather Forecast Office here in Fairbanks are watching the north slope weather very carefully. Say, uh, it might see some brief blizzard conditions, but uh, just to be safe, visibility will be dropping. The gusts will be coming up there, and a winter weather advisory will kick in tonight around 6 o'clock and last until at least 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, Thursday. Uh, so plan on some uh, increasing winds around the eastern Beaufort Sea coast, especially around Kaktovik, and decreased visibility as a result of that. So plan accordingly if you're on the north slope. Here's a look at the satellite picture now. A big change from just about a week ago. Remember when we had this huge area of high pressure across Alaska that was controlling everything? Well, that has shifted eastward as we were talking about and now is making room for the strong southerly flow to work its way up through the central and eastern Bering Sea. Because of that, the weather pattern is totally changing around. Low pressure now is forcing a lot of warm air up across uh, Nikolsky and Alaska, all the way from Cold Bay, Sandpoint, King Cove, all the way into southwestern Alaska. And you can see the resulting change, that south and southeasterly flow underneath that much warmer air. In fact, freezing levels are coming up, as we'll see in the aviation uh, section here in just a little bit, about two, 4,000 foot freezing levels here. And way down at the bottom of the Gulf here, we've got the jet stream working its way across right at the bottom of our picture. Freezing levels jump up to about six to even 10,000 feet. So there's a lot of warm air just kind of hovering in this region here. We've seen precipitation switch over to rain across some parts of the Aleutians and uh, really all the way up toward uh, St. Paul and St. George, uh, areas of rain mixed with snow at times there. Uh, still snow up around the Bering Strait and really still severe clear across most of uh, the interior. Now, the only other problem is as moist air is starting to move into this very cold situation, we've been getting fog across parts of Anchorage. And if you were moving around Anchorage earlier today, you probably noticed that. Low pressure sitting just on the southern end of southeastern Alaska. With that boundary moving through, we're getting some rain and snow around the Misty Fjords and Ketchikan. That looked like rain down below, but certainly snowing up top around Hyder this afternoon. And uh, again, we'll be watching that area of low pressure out west to see how fast does it move eastward. As it's running into that wall of cold, you can see the pressure lines here stacking up. And you know when that happens, that's when the winds really start to come up because all of the air here is trying to rush in and fill the void out here. That Mother Nature's uh, vacuum, more or less, is what low pressure is in the weather department. And uh, the resulting flow is this southerly wind that we see coming up 
over the Aleutians and the Alaska Peninsula. High pressure sitting out across the Gulf right now at 1,026 millibars. We've got the big cold high pressure system sitting up across the interior, and that ridge extends all the way into the Yukon and uh, parts of central and western Canada. We also have a decaying area of low pressure across the eastern Gulf. Uh, the main low here is keeping the precipitation going across southern parts of southeast. And we have plenty of dry air up across south central and southwestern Alaska. A couple of snow showers may be around Sparavon this afternoon. As we get into tonight, the winds, like we were talking about, will pick up and blow some of that snow around. We'll be watching for uh, reduced visibility here around Kaktovik as well. High pressure still sitting right along the Alcan border and over the Gulf. So still a lot of dry air here across the most of Alaska and really most of the Gulf. Watch for some spotty areas of rain and snow showers across parts of southeast. But the wind, look at that tight pressure gradient here across the Lynn Canal. The wind is not going to be in your favor around Skagway. The high wind warning will be in effect. Low pressure still moving northward across the northern Bering Sea. That warm air still collecting across southern and central parts of, uh, of the Bering Sea. Low pressure is working its way back toward Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. And again, everything we see here should be rain. Back behind that, though, it's pulling in more cold air. So uh, these frontal boundaries will likely gradually fall apart as we head toward the end of the week and the weekend. Uh, most of what we're seeing across southeast is dry air. It just hasn't completely won the weather picture just yet. And there's that front we were talking about. As that drops a little bit further south, closer to the North Slope coast, Places like Kaktovik will see winds come up. You might even see a little bit of snow. And so that winter weather advisory will be in effect at least until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. We'll see if we extend that there as that front uh, still won't be that far away. It'll depend on what the winds start to do there. High pressure is starting to lose some of its beefiness there at 1,038 millibars. It's still uh, a sizable force, but certainly not the strength that it once was as it was approaching 1050 not too long ago. And as this weakens and moves away, the resulting force is low pressure moving northward quickly. But look at that pressure gradient once again. The winds are going to come up across southwestern Alaska for sure, Kodiak Island, all the way through the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. So plan on some changes there as we go ahead into Friday and Saturday, especially as it pertains to wind and rain. Rain will be back in your forecast as we get toward Friday and Saturday. But uh, certainly could be looking at some snow around the Yukon Delta, Nunavak Island, and uh, maybe into parts of Norton Sound. There's St. Lawrence Island. You'll be dealing with wind and snow. And Kodiak Island, watch for periods of rain and snow around your region there. The higher train certainly looking at snow, but the surrounding areas and offshore, much better chance a lot of that's just going to be plain old rain. The good news is as we get into Friday, it looks like the orientation of the high pressure system and the trough that's been sitting across the eastern Gulf changes just enough that we don't get that really steep gradient coming across northern parts of southeast. And if that's the case, the wind should at least subside somewhat, if not an awful lot. So improvements should be coming your way as we get into Friday and Saturday as it pertains to the wind, especially around Skagway and the Lynn Canal down to Juneau. Out across the west, uh, we're still watching the uh, temperature and the precipitation mix up a little bit, so rain and snow could continue in the western chain. But again, most of the central and eastern chain and the Alaska Peninsula and Bristol Bay looking at rain as we get into the beginning of the weekend. Now, in the meantime, it is still cold and dry for the interior. Look at this, Yuka, Fort Yukon down to about 40 below. The middle Tanana Valley, Fairbanks, North Pole, you're looking at temperatures closing on 30 below. South Central, zero. Uh, uh, Golcana and uh, many of our friends up around Glen Allen, it's gonna be cold, probably 20 below there. Prince William Sound looking at 10 to 15 above. Kodiak Island, upper 20s. Southeast, teens and 20s, maybe the outer coast closer to 30. For blobs, you're looking at lows in the upper 30s. Same goes for the uh, Alaska Peninsula, most of the chain. West and southwestern Alaska in the single digits and teens. Nome at 18, Barrow at 9 below. High temperatures on Thursday, looking at 21 below in Fort Yukon, one of the colder spots. Eagle and Northway, also sub-zero. Fairbanks closing in on zero. Teens and 20s for south central, uh, close to 40 in Kodiak. 20s and 30s for southeast. The north slope, single digits, although 14 in Barrow, 15 in Wainwright. Kotzebue, you're looking at about 10. Nome, closer to the mid-20s, 31 around Savunga, 20s and 30s for south and western Alaska, 30s and 40s for the chain and the Alaska Peninsula. As we get into Friday morning, uh, it's still pretty cold across the upper Yukon and the middle Tanana Valley, no question about that. But those numbers are starting to come up a little bit for those nighttime lows, sign that the air isn't quite as dry as it once was. 
Uh, south Central, you're looking at single digit temperatures in the Friday morning, uh, 20s and 30s for most of South and Western Alaska, closer to 40, in fact, around Sandpoint. Savunga up to 23, Shishmaref near 7, teens and 20s for Southeast as you get into some of that colder and drier air. And as we get into Friday afternoon, your high temperatures hover in the lower to mid 30s. Ketchikan, though, might be closer to 40. 20s and 30s for South Central, a warmer day for Friday afternoon for many in South Central. In fact, 40 and Kodiak closer to the same for the Alaska Peninsula and St. Paul, 36. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to flying weather now, IFR conditions are expected around St. Matthew down to about the Pribilovs. MVFR conditions along the uh, south and western coast, but really not making it into uh, the coastline itself. Around Kodiak Island through the Alaska Peninsula, Dutch Harbor on Alaska through uh, Nikolski, and then kind of uh, getting close to Adak and Atka, but not really uh, making it all the way there. For the northern and eastern Gulf Coast, things should start off VFR for your Thursday morning and most of the interior and our northern passes will continue under the effects of high pressure, so widespread uh, visibility and ceiling issues should not be found there across the interior or southeast for your uh, Thursday morning or for the afternoon for that matter. As you look out west, that means most of the issues are going to be across the Barren. We've got a deep southerly flow moving moisture across cold waters, and that's going to keep things uh, pretty low for many locations. IFR setting into places like Savunga and the western end of St. Lawrence Island, the Pribilovs around the central Aleutians, around Sand Point down toward Cold Bay and Falls Pass. And notice MVFR is working w back into the central and western Gulf over Kodiak Island, but still fairly clear for the interior and southeast. For Friday morning, more of the same, that southern channel across the uh, western parts of the state and the eastern Bering Sea still in force there. We've got MVFR back across the north and eastern parts of the slope, as well as Beaufort Sea Coast, uh, IFR from St. Lawrence Island to Nunavak Island and down into the uh, windward side of the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. That continues to worsen as we get into Friday afternoon, with IFR stretching from St. Lawrence Island now all the way through the Alaska Peninsula and into Kodiak Island and Akiak, uh, most of southeast, the interior, the west, and the north, though, still flying under VFR, and that's what we have for your daytime tomorrow in Anaktivik Pass. VFR conditions there and for Attigan Pass, expecting all clear. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass looking for VFR conditions for your Thursday. Rainy Pass and Windy Pass also expected to maintain VFR through your day. Isabel Pass looking pretty good there, as well as Mentasta Pass calling VFR for your Thursday flying. Tanita Pass, we expect to see visual flight roll all day long. Portage Pass looking pretty good at this point, and Chilkoot and White Pass also looking to be VFR. On the freezing levels, and you can see the big difference that southerly wind makes across the west coast. The levels anywhere from two to even 4,000 feet over St. Lawrence Island to Nunavak Island and the yukon kuskokwim Delta region. Now, the bulk of the warmth is still well to the south, but you can see it's lurking not that far away. Here's the Gulf and uh, Haida Gwaii and uh, Vancouver Island. You'll notice those levels anywhere from two to about 10,000 feet, so a wealth of warm air, but remember that jet stream cuts right across here and that is really holding back that deep warmth, but a little bit nevertheless is snuck into the eastern Bering Sea and over the Bering Strait for your Thursday morning. So we do have to talk about icing potential. Levels are pretty high though. Uh, that deep moisture and the cold air meet up above about 6,000 feet around St. Lawrence Island uh, to about 8,000 feet around uh, Dutch Harbor on Alaska and out toward Cold Bay and Falls Pass at another colder layer there around the central chain. That's above 4,000 feet. So there is some colder air coming in behind this low pressure wave. Remnants of the last weather maker across southern parts of southeast and uh, western parts of British Columbia will hover around 8,000 feet and above. So isolated moderate continues, maybe a thin chance of that across the north slope there for your Thursday. Here's a look at the jet stream. Remember, we were talking about that, that really strong cutoff across the northern Gulf, and those levels uh, of the fast-moving winds holding back that heat a little bit right now across the southern Gulf. And we've got a deep southerly flow across the west coast. That's all part of that Pacific jet. Wind speed's 130 to 150 knots there. By the time it reaches up into the Bering Strait, still coming in from the south at 95 knots, and then looping over that ridge of high pressure and descending from the north around 70 and gaining speed to about 110 knots as it moves in to the Pacific Northwest, the Arctic jet well to the north. And uh, again, you can see the Pacific jet uh, really carving out a large trough in the west. So we get into a deep southerly flow across the west coast. Wind speeds sustained around 50 to 55 knots across the west coast. High pressure slowing things down for the interior, keeping it cool and dry. And north and westerly is descending across the eastern gulf around 20 to 30 knots or so. At 3,000 feet, a little bit more of a southeast to northwesterly bent here across the Alaska Peninsula, Bristol Bay. 
40 to 50 knots there, the ridge of high pressure across the Gulf and slower speeds across the interior once again. More of a west and northwesterly flow uh, for the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast, anywhere from 20 to about 30 knots or so. So strongest winds across the west coast right now. And because of that, that's where we're going to focus on turbulence for tomorrow. There may be isolated severe, just as there has been forecast for today, below about 4,000 feet. Uh, watch for widespread considerable moderate there, also across St. Lawrence Island. And even more widespread isolated moderate along the chain, along the peninsula, uh, across the west coast, St. Lawrence Island, up through the Bering Strait, and just grazing the North Slope communities as we go through your day. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right. Well, this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, which okay. are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. Kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how I mean, flat it could be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's it a lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station, mm -hmm. instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Oh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, because uh -huh. they're stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here, another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. So th those are the pictures, that if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is one you that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, for us in Alaska is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it edge on oh, like that. Right. So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit, okay. which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite 
those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth, mm -hmm. getting down toward International Space Station elevation, and they're not in the equatorial plane, rather their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this, and the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Hmm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day, and so you get a much closer image. We've got a, a shot from the uh, Sumi NPP satellite, uh -huh. Uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor. That's an acronym there. Okay. But it's a beautiful shot of Alaska, and you can see so much detail. The kind of detail, because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice, close imagery. You can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage, though, is that the satellite flies by, right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close. <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits. Uh, each has their strength. And amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Amazing oh, it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Time for a quick check of your sea ice edge, and you'll notice the pack ice is down below the Bering Strait and around St. Lawrence Island, but there's still marginal ice on the western end of St. Lawrence Island out around Gamble. Uh, east towards Savunga, the ice conditions are considerably different there. You'll also find some areas, a few Polinias perhaps, on the Yukon uh, Delta coastline and down toward Etolan Strait on the northern side of Nunavak Island, and then into southwest, you get uh, different thicknesses of ice and concentrations there as well. This is updated today. For the very latest information where you are, including if you want to look at Cook Inlet, where ice is south of Calgon Island now, uh, take a look at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. Here's a look at the wind report there for northern parts of the Lynn Canal. 55 knots out of the north, a high wind warnings poster for Skagway. That'll go from tonight through tomorrow for some pretty strong gusts on land up to about 65 miles per hour on sea. Of course, you're talking about uh, storm force winds there, 11 foot seas in the region, and uh, again, that's a lot of wind, and a lot of that's still moving southward as well, so strong winds in the entire region with the highest winds around Skagway, and for White Pass, again, a wind chill advisory down to 40 below in some cases there. Northwesterlies in Clarence Strait, and more of a east and northeasterly flow moving offshore for the outer coast, anywhere from 15 to 25, looking for seas from 7 to 8 feet, and uh, seas and winds diminish as we get into Friday. The pressure gradient relaxes a little bit more as we go up north. Uh, but watch for some gusts occasionally through Stevens Passage up to 35 knots as you get into Friday afternoon. Northerlies and Clarence Strait coming up as well with four-foot seas. Across South Central, winds are fairly light. Seas are generally small. They were from 10 to about 20 feet or 20 knots there for most areas. Uh, gusts out of the Copper River Delta region up to 25 knots with five-foot seas expected there. Easterlies coming into the northern Gulf 15 to 20, looking for seas at four to five feet. That comes up as we get into Friday with a low-pressure system moving northward. Uh, the winds are going to start moving a little bit more across the Barrens. 40 knots with 11 to 13-foot seas. Look for northerlies across the northern Cook Inlet. Northeasterlies inside of Prince William Sound with a three-foot sea. For southwest inside of Bristol Bay, 25 knots from the east with a three-foot sea. Northeasterly is a little bit uh, higher seas there in Shelikoff Strait, five-foot seas. Six to 17-foot seas coming down the Alaska Peninsula with the higher seas. And stronger winds moving in for Thursday and continuing to move north and east as we get into Friday. You can see the seas coming up to about 22 to 23-foot seas in the region. Around uh, Shelikoff Strait up to 40 knots with an 11-foot sea, 45 knots on the eastern side. And you'll see the stronger winds blowing into Bristol Bay and the Bering Sea as well. 9 to 11 foot seas expected on Friday. For the chain, southwesterlies from Kiska to Attu, 
As you get into the central and eastern part of the chain, east and south easterlies are coming up, anywhere from 14 to 18 foot seas on the Pacific side, 9 to 11 foot seas on the Bering. This is all wrapping into low pressure that's slowly moving northward. You can see more of a northeasterly push now as low pressure moves toward the Gulf, and that gives us winds around 15 to 20 knots, looking for 7 to 9 foot seas on the Bering, anywhere from 10 to 12 foot seas across the Pacific. Out west, expect 9 to 10 foot seas with more of a west and northwesterly flow at 15 to 20 knots. For the west coast, southeasterlies will be blowing 30 to 35 over the ice, looking for 7 foot seas in the open waters, as much as 17 foot seas around St. Matthew, a little bit lower around St. Paul and St. George on that 30 knot wind. For Friday, the higher seas move eastward toward Bristol Bay, as we saw a moment ago, 30 to 40 knots for many areas over the ice, 15 to 30 from St. Matthew to the Pribilovs, looking for 13 foot seas around the St. Matthew Island waters to wrap up the week. And up north, a south and easterly flow up the west coast, more of a southwesterly flow for the central and eastern Beaufort Seacoast. Remember, a winter weather advisory and the uh, possibility of poor visibility is expected around the Kaktovik region tonight into early tomorrow morning. Again, most areas anywhere from 20 to 30 knots as we get into Friday. The winds diminish somewhat, and that's good news again for visibility around Kaktovik. South and easterly is blowing offshore from Point Lay all the way down toward Kivalina with an easterly flow at 20 knots, 25 knots just south of the Bering Strait and north of St. Lawrence Island. Over the ice, again, as we get into your Friday. Let's recap tonight's weather across all of the great land. For southeast, periods of rain and snow across the southern part of the Panhandle. Up north, it's a lot of wind for the Skagway region. A high wind warning in effect until uh, tomorrow afternoon. Gusts to 65 miles per hour possible there. And wind chill advisories for the White Pass region could feel as cold as 40 below. A winter weather advisory around the Kaktovik region for poor visibility and blowing snow. Watch out for that. Otherwise, it is strong southerly winds moving up the west coast with warm air and rain for the Priblobs as we get into tomorrow. Otherwise, severe clear for most of the interior. Uh, looks like uh, generally clear conditions for most of south central, southeast. Windy, but uh, drying out there. A lot of sunshine expected out across the west. Unsettled weather continues there into Friday with a stronger system moving up toward Kodiak Island, bringing rain and snow to extreme southern portions of south central and rain and wind to the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island with snow across the Yukon Delta. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating. <laughs>